We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. All right, tonight, due to a longer than usual, totally unexpected absence, we're going to mix things up just a bit. For this segment, we're going to let you know where we are and where we were, sorry, and where we're going next, and then follow up by answering a few short questions from our mailbag. So we have an official Ask the Bellhop, and we are answering your questions. These are questions that just weren't big enough or, or too focused to fill a full episode. So, of course, the big question I expect is on all of our listeners and viewers' minds is, what happened? Where did you go? Yes, which is fully understandable, as we are right in the closing stretch leading up to episode 200, getting people hyped for three weeks in a row, and then nothing. Silence. Uh, well, Deanna sent out some emails and Sean managed to put some tweets online, I think for the most part, for the average person, or average listener, we just stopped for no good reason. Well, we're here to let you know that we did not pod fade. We didn't make it all the way to 199 just to stop without any announcement or anything like that. <laughs> we care too much to do that to you. Yeah, no, not at all. And 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 we have no plans on stopping now. At 200th episode, I hope to celebrate our 300th, 500th. 600th maybe our thousandth episode who knows recorded from the retirement home at that point possibly um what actually happened is my family after almost three years of playing it safe and following all of the health unit's recommendations finally caught COVID-19 and not positive but asymptomatic COVID either full-on high fever causing hallucinations um dialing um telehealth Ontario moments from calling an ambulance COVID once that hit no one was in any shape to send out a notification other than a few quick tweets and posts on social media. Yeah, well, I would have loved to have like just put out something saying, hey, we caught COVID, we'll be back. This was bad, and it's lasted forever. Um, I had the worst of it, but all five members of my immediate family had it, and everyone spent multiple days in bed recovering. Even now, my mom and I still have a bit of a lingering cough, and I don't think it's happened yet, but I do apologize if I fail to catch any of them by muting tonight, and you have to listen to me cough. COVID is not done and over with, people. Mask up and stay safe. Now, once things did start to look better for all of us, we got more bad news medically. Uh, Deanna was suddenly having vision problems, and after getting that checked out, it ends up she had a torn retina in one of her eyes, most likely caused by severe coughing from COVID. This eventually led to emergency laser eye surgery which props to the local eye doctors in Windsor for getting her in as quickly as we did. Now, while most people know Deanna is part of the team and recognize her as a moderator, she does a lot more work behind the scenes than I think most people think or expect. Yeah, and it's not just editing my work so I don't sound like an idiot <laughs> due to uh, various, various disabilities I have with letters and words. Um, of importance in this particular case, though, is she's the one that sets up and runs all our giveaways. She's the one that knows how to get Rafflecopter to work and does all the cross-linking and promotion. So even if Sean and I were doing well, we still needed her to be able to set things up for episode 200. To make things even more complicated, I also came down with a head cold, thankfully not COVID, but enough reason to postpone recording for one more week. Yeah, so basically, we are all good to go. We are ready for episode 200 and then got hit by medical issues we're still recovering from even today. At this point, Deanna is still dealing with her eye surgery and the fallout from that. She's still having vision problems. And all of us have some lingering cold-like symptoms, but not enough to keep us from recording tonight and know we're no longer contagious. If you see us out and about, you don't have to run away. In fact, I was out getting this haircut for the 200th episode when I got the news that COVID had hit the family. Yes. <laughs> I feel bad. Sean got a special haircut for our 200th episode. That's not something I'm going to be doing. Now, we're counting on the fact that everything and everyone will heal up nicely so that everything's good to go for next week. It better be at this point. Now, I will say, while recovering, once I was feeling better to be on the computer for a bit, I did manage to get out a few unboxing videos on the blog, which is something I do now and then. I put up copies of our unboxing videos on the blog with a short description. That's mainly for SEO purposes, but at least something was coming out. So if anyone visited the page, the last post wasn't from January. Um, I did get out one YouTube unboxing as well, as well as two YouTube reviews, because it was stuff that we had kind of saved up. And our reviews are already delayed a week for YouTube. So at least there was something to get out of there. So once I was feeling over, we were able to trickle that out. 
Now, at this point, I do have one more unboxing way to go out. Uh, it should have went up today. Uh, I was hoping for today, but today was a day of interruptions and it just didn't happen. Um, and I actually started working on a new article um, based on running supers RPGs, which is shows just how many articles I could use to catch up on at some point. So I've been I was working with Sean on that a little bit um, in the coming weeks. I, things should get back on track. Um, for example, as part of tonight's show, later on the, on tonight, we're going to review Dolce from Stronghold Games. Uh, the written review for that should go live this weekend, and then the video will be next week. So everything should be on track for that. I actually got more games in than Mo for a change. Yes. As with the lockdown at their house, I went out to help out with the local event at the Barbershop Bar. Yeah, that's the other problem is it's, uh, here we are started up. I'm hosting public play events again. It's awesome. And I already had to cancel. And unfortunately, I'm going to also miss the one uh, this month because we're going to be out of town for Deanna's birthday. So locals, uh, another little heads up here for those of you paying attention to the next event will be on March 11th at the Barbershop Bar, though, again, I will not be attending. But I do I have a if... couple of bags of games that will probably show up <laughs> there. So show, hopefully Sean will show up and, and take my place. Now, as for me in gaming, it's been almost nothing. Like, I, I, I jumped on Board Game Geek today because I do that before every podcast episode so I can talk about the games we played since the last time we recorded. Well, it's been months. It was January 25th the last time we recorded, and I looked it up, and, and I'm like, oh, man, it looks terrible. So for anyone who's listened to our recent episodes heard me all excited about how I played more games in January of 2023. So, like, more games this year than I played every month of last year and i'm like oh it's gonna be so much better this year than last year well in february i played one one game and when i played it last night on the 28th the last day of the month i got in one game this month that just goes to show how lousy everyone was feeling like it wasn't even like a sit up we didn't even play video games because it's just like video games were too much work yeah. uh, it was rough all right well enough about where we've been it's time to move on to something new Yes. For the rest of this segment, we're going to answer a few questions from our mailbag that are a little too easy, specific, or short to dedicate an entire episode to. Now, here's one that seems especially appropriate for tonight. <laughs> Amanda Stumantis L. writes, Okay, sign of the times type of question. What is a great game for a 10-year-old to enjoy with their grandparents via a Zoom call over the winter? Looking to spice up COVID cold and flu season visits for everyone. Now, this actually might be an evergreen topic I return to with just because I have a feeling we're going to have COVID cold and flu season every year going forward. Now, it's it's probably just going to be endemic and one of those things we have to deal with and we all get shots for every year. So this might turn into a full topic, but at this point, I figured it'd be nice and short. Um, so what the first game that came to my mind, I didn't do a ton of research on this one. This is kind of off the cuff stuff I just thought of while typing out the question earlier today was monstrosity because that game I saw people play over zoom and I think it was 99 people played. It was ridiculous. It was the, um, uh, crystal Dax from the board game, our game spotlight. Or, oh my God. I feel so bad. I can't remember. It's short, short episodes. They're only like 15 minutes long oh, board game. Oh, I can't believe I can't remember. It's Crystal and Ambi. I apologize, Crystal, for totally blanking Board on the name of your Blitz. show. Blitz, thank you. I'm like, short thing, Blitz. Board Game Blitz. Uh, from the Board Game Blitz podcast. Now, I don't remember if Crystal, this was part of the Board Game Blitz podcast or something she was doing on her own or with the Dice Tower. Crystal's kind of all over the place. Um, but they sat and described the monster, and everyone at home just had like a sheet of white paper and drew what they were describing and then all held it up to their webcams. And then whoever was the awesome person in the back room who was controlling all the cameras and stuff showed some of the best. So that was my first thought was was monstrosity, I think, would be great, especially a 10 year old. Right. You got a 10 year old playing with grandparents. Grandparents, I'm sure, can describe monsters and can draw well enough as a 10 year old. Yep. Uh, and I think the next one that comes to mind is the one that we've played online and we've had fun with both, uh, you know, individually and as groups. That's Codenames Duet with the yeah. code with their own uh, their own website. Yeah, it's, it's codenamesonline.com or something. I, I will throw a link to this in the show notes. Here's proof that I didn't do research tonight. See, when we do an ask, I usually do research and Google all this stuff and find links. No, sorry. <laughs> We're still not 100%. And it's codenames.game. <laughs> codenames.game where you can play regular codenames or duet. So yes, that's not necessarily over Zoom, but I don't see any reason that you couldn't play Codenames Duet over Zoom because of its cooperative nature. You should be able to play that game with a fairly simple web, uh, webcam setup. 
Um, what I would recommend is if you can have clue cards at both ends and don't necessarily use like the fronts and backs of the, like, you know what I mean? So you can, can kind of match them up, but really you, you probably can play it. Like, like just go to code names, games.net. I already code, forgot. Code names, not games. Thank you. Code names, not games and play that way. Uh, one I saw strongly recommended is patchwork doodle, which is a, a roll and write game where you're, you're uh, well flipping, right? Where you're getting patchwork, patches that you then draw in on your board and another one would be oh so clever which is the extremely popular um uh wolfgang warsh roll and write and honestly all roll and writes i i can't think of a roll and write that doesn't fit this because everyone just needs their own sheets and most roll and writes you can get the sheets online for free that's most of them but most companies provide pdf versions of their roll and write sheets for you to print out so just one person has to own the game and roll the dice and then everyone else Goes online, prints out whatever copies they need, and then you can play whatever roll and write. Well, and, and the other option, of course, is with, with Board Game Arena, you set up a Zoom call, have Board Game Arena open in the corner, and you've got, yes. uh, you know, Railroad Inc. is on uh, Board Game Arena now, for instance. Yeah. Well, at Board Game Arena, honestly, like instead of codenames.game, just go to Board Game Arena. You can play almost any game. You can play anything online. I, I, a ten year old. Eh. Well, that, that's um, why. That's uh, why I was sticking with with the you know uh, railroad. Well, I, I was just trying to think of some quick board game arena games for a ten year old. I can't stop. Um, sushi go, sushi go party. Um, go nuts for donuts. What you play? Yep. Um, possibly Azul. That might be something that might hook the grandparents a little more that a ten year old can play. My ten year old, when she was ten, could play it. Well, even just something as simple as Haggis, right? It's just yep. basically you know basic card games and such. Uh, where you don't have to worry about, you know, two different decks in two different locations. You've got one deck yeah, online. One deck online. That's true. Um, one I saw it. So I did do a little bit of research on this. I just Googled it to see what people's top list. The top of the list for almost everyone was Welcome to, which I know is another flip and right. Welcome to is a game I need to try. I've never actually played it. I've heard really good things, but I'll admit I kind of stay away from rolling right games. I hadn't really been wowed by any. That is until we played Dice Kingdoms of Valeria. Which Dice Kingdoms of Area I don't recommend. Uh, not for a 10-year-old and grandparents. No, I, no. I, a 10-year-old and grandparent to me means non-gamer. So if they happen to be 10-year-old gamer and gaming grandparents, go for it. But And Welcome to and Welcome to Las Vegas are both on BGA. Yeah, so again. <laughs> uh, another one that, that works is the, the basically Werewolf or any of the social deduction games. Especially if you got the moderator. So if you're doing 10-year-old with grandparents, you have the parent play moderator. Um, and then you can play through those games. Now, the only problem with Werewolf is you need quite a few players. So so I don't know how many people are in the family for this to work. So you, you need you need a fairly big group. Um, I am not a fan of Werewolf, so I couldn't even tell you what the minimum player count is. But I have to assume it's more than two or three, right. probably like four or five. Uh, but then One Night Ultimate Werewolf or uh, The Resistance or some of the other social deduction games I think would work well. Uh, One Night Ultimate Werewolf is three plus. So it's three, three plus. Three to so there you go, three. three. Uh, wow. How do you play that? They one? recommend four to 10 is uh case community. Okay. Best is six to eight. Yeah. So, but, but recommend four. So that's not bad. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, is word games tend to work well. Word based party games. Uh, the one I call out is trap words, but you know what I would do is I would just ditch the whole dungeon, defeat the monster, get cursed part. I would just play. I, basically you'd be playing taboo where the other team picks the words you can't say. That, that's what I would do. I, I would modify trap words. Um, what's what's the other one? No, letter jam wouldn't work well with Zoom, I don't mm, think. No, that would be no. What is it? What's the other game I got with trap words at the same time from CGE? Was it letter jam? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, they came at the same yeah. time. So, and no, that one doesn't work. I, there's another word game that I swear will work, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Um, one that would be a lot of fun is Super Cats. There, there's your, you know, 10 year old because only one player needs to see all the cards. Like, yes, technically the grandparents would need five cards and from the flip to their super sentai side. But like you could use anything. You, you could right. just use playing cards, right? That are all on their, their backside and you flip them over to the right side. But then the player, the, the, the main player is going to have to build Robo Dog out of the actual cards for the game. Uh, breakdancing meeple would probably work if as long as you had two copies of the game there are quite a few that if you each had a copy of the game yeah i think it's easier probably best to try and avoid that though if necessary yeah. they, i'm sure the grandparents aren't going to want to have a bunch of games that they <laughs> they That's sit around true. and only that they only play when they're when they're talking to their kids on zoom 
Uh, tech is saying uh, tiny towns done over Zoom. He's seen people do it, so that's pretty cool. Um, the what? other thing I would strongly recommend, uh, as long as your grandparents are open to it, maybe don't tell them that's what it is, is play an RPG. Like any type of RPGs work great online. And you're thinking 10 year old, like go, go to the simple ones, right? Like, like magical kitties save the day. Uh, even the D and D adventure begins. You go buy a copy of that. All you need is a D 20 and technically anyone can roll online, but you just send them a link to an A online roller. Yep. There's millions of them. There's tons of them. You don't have to pay for send them an online roller and run them through a, a very descriptive one. Medium. Uh, that could be interesting. Medium would work again, though. You need no. You'd only need one copy. Yeah, of the you cards. only need one copy. You only need one, except for the whole. No, because you're supposed to play a card, right? Mm. You're picking a card from your hand to pair with what's up. So that would require two copies of the game. I think it would work, but you'd need two copies, like multiple copies of the game. Street magic with Trello for the cards. I don't know. I'm sorry. Did you say street magic? I don't know that one. Not a game I know. So Jeff pull up, Jeff Jeff living up to his reputation and pulling out the indie game I've never heard of. I'm sorry, did you say street match? Um strong recommended for For the Queen, but I don't think you want to play that with a 10 year old. Mm, fair. Like I, I would strongly recommend that one if it was an 18 year old trying to play with Zoom with their parents, maybe. I don't even know. That it's, one doesn't quite right. I, I, there's got it. Did anyone make a kid's version of For the Queen yet? I'm like, I don't know what sure. it's for the Scoopy snacks or something. I you based on how many different for the Queens there are out there. I would be shocked if there aren't. I'd I, I can't remember. What there's got to be. I can't, a, there's a that one version. website that sort of collects all the different for the Queens. And I mm-hmm. can't remember what that site is right now. But um, it was funny. You were you we were mentioning uh, Roland Wrights earlier and thinking of um, Railroad Inc. Uh, and that got played at the uh, at the barbershop bar. Uh, nice. And yet again, I, I discussed it with the people there and no one I have ever met. Has actually the used the extra dice. I've never someone that Nobody. owns a game is going. I'm going to play it with them. They're going to use the dang blue dice or red dice or green dice or yellow dice or Cthulhu dice. <laughs> nobody's yes. ever done. Nobody's ever used the bonus dice. Yeah, I I honestly don't know what any of them do because I don't own the games myself. Yeah, okay. and I have played tons of games with the normal because that that's one you can play online. There is a a free version of Railroad Rink online where you can choose which dice to use. And you can play it solo. So I played many times and just tried to beat my own score kind of thing. Yeah, Tech was even at that table. Like, nope, yeah. no bonus dice. No bonus. I, yeah, I, I actually Tech had, we had talked on Facebook and that was the first thing I asked. Did you use bonus dice? It's like, nope, <laughs> no bonus dice. I'm like, no one, no one yeah. uses. Scott, you listening? I don't know. Does Scott listen to our podcast? Scott, know. bring out, the, Scott's probably the one who brought. Railroad oh yeah, no, he was. It was Scott. Yeah, and I asked see, him, I was gonna say, but, he, but I asked him and he said, no, I've never used that. <laughs> Scott's never used them. He's had that game for like six years. <laughs> so I played it with Scott like the well, weekend yeah, that, it came out. Yeah, that was the CG the, Realm. Same here. I was there and that was the yeah. first time I'd ever that, that was the only time I've ever played Railroad Inc. in person wow. was uh was that time from with Scott's copy. No one else would work was is any of these games that we're gonna be talking about later, the bingo style games, which I someone else coined that term, and I'm like, you know what? It actually fits, right? Because you call out the thing and then everyone uses so all the games where someone calls out a thing and then everyone finds that same card or that same piece or that same resource and then uses that to do something. So that's why Tiny Towns works. But I honestly, like, we're going to be talking about Dolce later, but again, 10-year-old, I don't know if a 10-year-old would get Dolce and non-gaming grandparents. No, because Dolce is heavy. But that (laughs) style of game. So number nine, there, there's my recommendation. Number nine, can play as many people as you have pieces. And I know people who have bought four copies of the game to be able to play it with a classroom full of people because i think each copy plays four players and this let you get to 16 players so number nine which is I, i'm saying number nine but it's nmbr9 with no space if you're trying to find that on the googles <laughs> or board game geek uh one i listened to a lot of podcasts so that is one of the things i did when i wasn't feeling good is i sat and listened to podcasts and like for me i i am way more caught up than usual but i'm still way behind <laughs> and i listened to an episode about dumb game names and while well, number nine was on that list because it's it's not a bad name based on the gameplay, but when you try to like order it or you go into a game store and you're like, hey, can you get number nine? And you don't know that it's NMBR9. They're like, they're like, yeah, hobby gamers think it's cute and people who are on board game geek know it. But like the average person who's hearing, here's a great game to play with my 10 year old. Hey, I was listening to Tabletop Bellhop the other day and I heard about this great game to play with my 10 year old and their grandparents should like it. Can you get me in a copy of number nine? 
And then like the game store owner like only sells Magic the Gathering cards, so doesn't know board games and jumps on to the Alliance website and is like, no, sorry, I can't I can't seem to find that game. Don't do that, publishers. Yep. For more reasons than you did. Like it's it's not just just trying to spell it. It there there are multiple reasons you shouldn't do that. Yeah. All, All right. right. Uh, so uh here. Yeah. I think we I think we covered that one pretty uh, thoroughly. Yeah, there you go. I, I think we're good. I, like I said, I might at some point deep dive this a little more, but it was pretty specific with the 10-year-old grandparents and Zoom calls. All right, well, here's more of a philosophical one instead of a game recommendation one. Yep. Gagan China asks, board game question, not sure if you did an article on this, but Catan is quite popular. I've only played it one years ago myself, but gamer groups rarely play it. Why is that? So I think what, what Guggen's really asking here is why do people hate Catan, right? Like it, it's it's listed as a top. I don't know where it is on Board Game Geek. Where is it on Board Game? You can look that up while yep. I'm talking. Yep. I wonder where it is on Board Game Geek right now because it's it, it's old. Why why all the hate, right? Like like I, obviously Guggen liked it, right? And I think what he was trying to say was maybe once he played maybe once years ago. There's potentially a chance I taught him. Um, Guggen was very active in the University of Windsor gaming scene and had started up a gaming club there that I worked with him on. And uh, we were starting to play games at, there was like a pizza pizza style place. And we were playing games there a couple times. And eventually we moved into the green bean by the university. So I kind of got Guggen into hobby gaming and he managed to get a bunch of university students out, which are people we still see out to this day, which is pretty awesome. But back then I'm sure we played Catan, right? And back then I had a billboard that we used to post on the back wall that had a picture of Catan. Because that was the recognizable, it's a hobby game, along with chess pieces. Because again, that was recognizable as, oh, that means games. You know, pawns mean games. And I had a pair of 2D6 dice, right? Um, but even back then, be like, oh, you want to play Catan? And be like, no, nah, I don't want to play. So off the top of my head, like th this is pure theory. For one, there are a bunch of us that played a lot of Catan. Um, I bought Catan. I have I, any longtime fans of the podcast have heard this story before. Out of gaming, went to uh, where Deanna and I are about to go to London. We're sitting at Ferrari's having an amazing, uh, uh, what do you call them? Omelet, sausage and bacon omelet. We're so good there. And I've just run across the street randomly to a little convenience store and buy an issue of Games Magazine. And we decide we're going to London that day. And whenever whenever we went on a train trip, I buy Games Magazine. That's what we do on the trip. And then I look it up. And in this episode, it has the Games 100, the top 100 games of all time. And I say to Deanna, I, this is without even flipping it open, we're going to buy the number one game. Whatever it is, we're going to buy it. And that game was Catan. And when we get back to Windsor, we tried we looked online for hobby shops. We found out there was a hobby shop called Hugen and Munin, which we'd never been to, that was actually close to Deanna's end of town. We drove over there and we're like, oh my God, it's the guy from the sci-fi shop, Ian, who used to run a, a geeky sci-fi gaming store downtown with, uh, I think he was an employee, not an owner. Maybe he was the owner. I don't know. There was a couple of people I met through then. And then they're like, hey, do you have this Catan game? And sure enough, he has Catan. And we started playing Catan and we love Catan and we played Catan and we played and we played and we played. Uh, this happened to be a period of time when my parents used to go to Texas and we would host it and to host it, we would go to their house on the weekend and we would bring Catan and we would invite people over like snail runs and uh, Sean now in Edmonton, not Sean from Hamilton, Sean formerly from Hamilton or Sean Hamilton, a different Sean that I used to collect who now lives uh, far away uh, would play. And there was usually beer involved. Uh, of course, back then it was pretty crappy beer. Maybe maybe Walkerville was like a good night, but there was beer involved. and We played a lot of Catan um, to the fact that we played so much Catan. We're like, Catan's awesome. We need more. And I would go back to uh, Hugo and Immunity and like, oh, okay, you got more Catan. Oh, okay, here's Surf Seafarers. Then we play the heck out of that. And I'm like, all right, you got more Catan. Oh, Cities and Nights. Oh, Ian, there's a problem, though. Like, this is so popular. We're getting more people. Can I get another copy? So we'd have two copies of Catan. And second, what? what five or six player expansion? We can play with more people. Oh, give me those two. So didn't take long. It was basically over a period of one or two, I think it might have been two summers. Might have been two summers that we all got hooked on Catan and got a bunch of people hooked on Catan. And that would be my reintroduction to hobby board games. Like from there, I then went, well, what's game number two? Oh, Power Grid. I should pick that up. What's game number three? And eventually I'm like, someone's like, oh, have you checked Board Game Geek? What? Board Game Geek? 
This is 2003. Board Game Geek's brand new. I went on Board Game Geek. Number one, Tigris and Euphrates. So I'll have to pick that up too, and so on. But fast forward five, seven, eight, ten. Now it's 20 years later, literally. Wow. It's 20 years later. I don't feel like playing Catan at all. I, I have played Catan. I, I used to bring Catan to public play events because it's so good at hooking new people. It's showing people that board games can be more than Monopoly and you don't just roll dice to move. They can do other things. And it teaches trading and all these great things. But I have no interest in even playing it now. Like none. I, I bought the Traders and Barbarians expansion because I didn't have it. I've never opened it. It's downstairs because I just have no interest. One, so one of my things with Catan is I didn't overplay it. I wasn't yeah. in the wave of gamers who got introduced to hobby gaming through Catan. And so I didn't get this massive wave, which means when I sit down with a, with a bunch of people who have played Catan, it's a lot less fun for me because yeah. they've already played through all of it and they know all the ins and outs of Catan. And I don't. I haven't played the death played to death of it. So it's just not as much fun for me because I am not, you know, there's a, a massive skill imbalance simply mm -hmm. from the sheer volume of play. Uh, and yep. so I would probably enjoy Catan if I played with a bunch of people who've barely ever played Catan before, uh, but trying to find a bunch of people who have barely ever played Catan before is actually quite difficult. Yep. Uh, and so in that, for that purpose, for that reason, I've kind of always just tuned out Catan and it's like, yeah, that's that game. Okay, fine. I mm -hmm. great game. I'm, it, you know, it's got a fantastic place in board game history. It's currently 488th overall. See, on, that's pretty good. On for board it, game it, it, more than 20 year old game at this point. And, uh, you know, it's just, that's great. I have respect it for its history. I have played it, but I don't ever really need to again yep uh another one i see not as much anymore but uh that, i don't know what you call it board game hipsterism <laughs> there, the, some people think they're too good for Catan. um it, it, which honestly that's the same attitude of making fun of people who play monopoly which no one should do if people are enjoying a game let them enjoy it um so there becomes this yeah i did that i'm better than Catan. i now play heavier games um, listen to our entire episode on the board game life cycle and realize that like everyone kind of goes through that phase in some way. Some are more smug about it than others where you're just like, oh, I've moved past that game. I'm on. To, I like heavy games. I like I, I like more. In, oh, my games have to be three hours long or six hours long. And they kind of you get this this clickism of it that actually kind of sucks. It's not a good part of the industry. Um, and I find a lot of people seem to have that about Catan in particular. Like Catan is up there with Monopoly on games I snub because I'm beyond them. Right. Or as, or as Snail Run says, I thought I liked Catan, but I liked the alcohol that went along with playing Catan. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Totally fair. Yeah. The one thing, uh, the the one Catan... thing about Monopoly is you don't hate, don't hate, hate on people who like Monopoly, but if they're playing Monopoly and actively hating it, then yeah. yes, you can hate on them yes. because they, yeah, yeah. they don't, they, they clearly just don't know that there is more out there and they're yes. just playing it because they don't know any better. Yep. Then there is a reason to sort of introduce them to more things and try and push yep. them out of it. But if they're enjoying themselves, I'm not sure how, but more power to them. Yes. I, like I said, my, my daughter started up a board game club. We haven't talked about that in weeks because, well, we haven't been here. Um, but the most played game at it is Monopoly and it's in a half hour lunch break. So, like, they, they enjoy starting Monopoly. They, they enjoy rolling the dice, moving, and maybe owning some property. Like, 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 I don't know. I don't. Obviously, they enjoy the company of playing a game with someone. Right. You know, I, buying, I think, buying, having money. I, the the like, capitalist like the, dream before it gets to the capitalist cutthroat, reality yeah. uh, later in the game. Yeah, I don't know. But like, she can't can get people to play hobby games, right? Like, she's trying. And we keep having, and this is something I don't know if you've noticed in my game recommendation list, I've shifted to recommending easier, simpler games overall. I'll still recommend the big ones, but I'll call them out as the big ones because I have learned that, that I have a narrow perspective as a hobby gamer of what people are willing to play. Um, and it's something else Eric Lang has been calling out recently that you don't realize how little the average person wants to learn to do something 
They just want to sit down and do the thing. And so games where you can literally go roll the dice and I'll show you what happens are better than anything you have to read a rule book for first. Yeah. Right. So and I now know this as a thing. Now, I'm we're obviously most of the people listening to us are hobby gamers and we're going to keep recommending hobby games. But I'm now more cognizant of that. So when I'm doing recommendations, I'm a lot more careful. And if you look at the games I bring to the barbershop bar compared to the games that I'm going to bring out when Sean, Tori and Kat are coming over, they're in two different classes of games. And no, one is not better than the other. Yeah. No, it was really interesting, actually. This last uh, time at uh, the barbershop bar, uh, there was a young uh, couple with four kids with them. And nice. they were playing, uh, They when we first got there, they were playing apples to apples, and they were having a grand old time. Uh, and eventually they kept coming over, the, the, one, of the, one or two of the boys kept coming over and checking out the table full of games and trying to mm. see what they wanted to play. Uh, and at one point they grabbed smash up Disney because the, the other team, Ooh. the other table had finished. And I said, yeah. you know, look, this is, this one may be a little hard for you guys. Uh, if, if, if everyone's interested, we can, we can start looking at it, but I, I recommend maybe trying something a little else, a little different. And then I pulled up drop it and I said, would you guys yeah. like to try this? And I'll give this a try. They ended up playing uh, four, five games <laughs> in a row of it. Yeah. Um, but drop they, it there's nothing to teach right like pick exactly. up a piece and drop it in right yep. and and then here's how you score here's when you don't get points and that's yep. it and they had they had a fantastic time uh and unfortunately that's when i discovered that ian doesn't have copies of it at the store yeah that's but, uh that's like for every event i think we're going to go through that one maybe they can get them in now yep all right moving back to Catan. so another reason Catan's old Games have progressed, changed, gotten more interesting, more engaging um, to go with what we were just talking about. You can't sit someone down and just play Catan. The first decision in Catan is where to place your first settlement. And if you've never played before, you don't know what you're doing. You need to know the game to make that choice. Now, yes, I do strongly recommend new players use the preset setup. No one does this, but they should because it removes that decision at the beginning. And then you can get into, you know what? You are playing these two settlements already set up. Roll the dice. I'll tell you what happens. You want to get to that point as quick as possible. But Catan has things in it like player elimination. No, you can't be eliminated from the game, but you can get cut off so that you can never build anything ever again, which is the equivalent of player elimination. Mm -hmm. It has hidden information that people can spring on you to win which is great when you're a competitive tournament player and you know there are four victory point cards in, like Sean said, the, acknowledge, the players who know the game versus the ones that don't. I know there are four victory point game cards in that development deck, and I know you can hold on to them until the end of the game and go, I'm only at seven, but I have three of these. And if you use cards to look at other players' hands and you know how many you have and you know the odds, you can play to that. Well, the average player is not going to enjoy that take that moment, that... Oh, the race to 10, but I have 10 at seven. It's not fun for everyone else at the table. It's fun for the person who does it. Again, unless you're playing with a bunch of experienced Catan players, like, oh, you managed to pull it off. Good job. Um, the um, There's no actual exploration or discovery in the game. Like, despite the fact on what it's kind of trying to sell you, it's not what it is. It, it, it's, a, it's a trading game. It is a race and a trading game. And people don't necessarily realize that when they're told, oh, it's all about settling this land. I'm like, no, no, it's a race. You're trying to make the longest road. You're trying to build the largest army. You're trying to get to 10 points. And it's all about trading with other players. Plus, yeah. it can be broken depending on your group. If you get social in the game where someone doesn't like someone at the table and goes, I'm not trading with them, that can ruin the whole game experience. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's it's interesting to note that again, they've changed the name of the game from Settlers of Catan to yes. Catan Trade Build Settle. Uh, well, they, that <laughs> is also also a a trying to improve the um, accessibility is not the right word. And see, this is what happens when it's been four weeks. They're removing the colonialism from it. You are now part of Catan and trading building. You're not settling. Right. It's removing an aspect, which actually I think was a really good call. Yep. No, it's, it's more progressive there. Catan has gotten more progressive in a very subtle way that I think is brilliant. Because I got to admit, even the old version, I never felt it was colonial. It, 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 it to me was a deserted island when you were settling it. You weren't exploiting anyone, but I can see how some people saw it that yep. way. 
And the fact of the matter is the game is really more about the trade and build yes. than the settle. And, and yes. the new renaming sort of has reemphasized that and refocused on what the game was already about, uh, yes. but made it more clear in its branding. Very true. Yeah. So Ryan is saying half the players shorten it to calling it Settlers. The other's just Catan. Yeah. I was one of the people who was Settlers. Yep. Do you want to play Settlers? Can you come over and play Settlers? We're going to yep. play some Settlers. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and they're saying, like Ryan saying, always starts with the preset board at the rule book center with new players. And I agree you should. But honestly, it just feels dated. Like, like I think there's, there's better games where you roll dice to generate resources. We've talked about all of three of the big ones nowadays. And there it's... are better games for trading stuff. There are better games for building routes and connecting routes. Like it just, it, it, it stands up to the test of time. And the fact that I don't think it's a bad game in any way, but it is 28 years old. There you go. 28. <laughs> it's even older than I thought. Yeah. So, so there's another reason people don't play it. Now with that new hotness, there are many board game Epicureans out there. I am one of them that are more interested in playing something new and hot and interesting than playing something old, no matter how good it might be. My kids are like this, and I don't know, like, I don't think that was the way I raised them, but, like, trying to get my kids to do old, play old things, like, from the Switch, like, you have access to, like, 80 games from the NES. No, no interest whatsoever. Well, yeah, oh, now we have Super Nintendo games. No, these these are old games, Dad. We don't play old games. <laughs> but meanwhile, they'll play I Am Bread for six hours straight, but I can't get them to play, like, Metroid, you know? But whatever, that's that's their thing, right? They're they're all about modern, flashy, whatever, right? Like different style. And even with board games, they're like, oh, that looks like an old game, Dad. Is that an old one? And and they're no interest. Like they have no interest in learning. Like I get it, they're kids. No interest in learning Power Grid doesn't seem that strange. But like the way Gwen plays, I think she'd love Power Grid. With, with her or the planning out every decision and planning ahead and watching her play Ticket to Ride, you're like, oh, she'd like building roads and power grid. <laughs> but like no interest at all. They're like, no. But what about that game you got that showed up the other day? That they're all interested in. Right. So I don't know. Any any other reasons you can think of why why people, why gamer groups don't play Catan? I think we've covered sort of all the major spots yeah. between between the game being tired, people being tired of it, of it, hipsterism. Uh, and the lack of someone like me who wanting to get involved yeah, into into some into a game with people who are already deep into it or already were deep into it. Yeah, actually, I find that one fascinating. I hadn't even considered that. But yeah, like like it's hard to beat Deanna in many games, but Catan she's particularly good at, and you have to know how to stop her or she'll win. Right. I know how to stop her. Other players we play with know how to stop her. She has a certain strategy that works most of the time. If you can prevent that strategy, at least she has to branch out and you've got a chance. Right. But if you don't know, you're in trouble. Yeah. Now, where I do think Catan still stands up is that it's still a good, and I like this. I mean, I think I'm going to try to do this. So the Dice Tower has stopped using the term gateway game. They, uh, because it, it, it kind of reeks of gatekeeping. Mm. And what they now use is welcoming game. And I kind of dig that. So I'm going to try to use that. I don't know if I'll be able to shift my entire vocabulary over. So I'm going to try to do that, but I still think Catan is a good welcoming game for people in particular like Monopoly, like the the, the two dice, because it does a really good job of showing off subtle changes from what games used to be to what games are now. That that you, you have your hand of cards is like having a hand of money or more so a hand of properties. The fact you can trade your resources is just like trading properties. So they've anyone who's playing Monopoly properly has that trading down. They're used to rolling two dice to move. Now you're rolling two dice to do something else. That's an eye opener. Like I'm amazed by how much that blows people away. A good example of this, Jeff Seuss might remember this. We're at the Windsor Comic Con and we're showing off the Funkoverse games. And a couple sits down and they it happened to be um Jean Grey as as uh the Phoenix and uh I think it was Beast sat down to play this game and the first thing they did, I said it's your turn. They grabbed the dice and rolled them. And and I said, what are you doing? They're like, well, I'm rolling to to see how far I can move. I'm like, no, no, no. Okay. And like just that right there kind of opened my eyes. I'm like, oh, wow. Most people think the start of any game, like, well, think Clue, Monopoly, uh, Sorry, Trouble, all starts with roll the dice to figure out how far you can move. Yep. I'm like, no, 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 not that. That dice is used to figure out combat. Here's how you move. Your character has a movement rate, you know, and they were just like, 
Yep. Dice can be used for more than figuring out how far you can move. Yep. All right. That's well, a good one. Jeff Seuss is saying an opener game. Yep. A game you introduce to a friend to open the world of games to them. I like that one too. Openers. Sub yeah, and sits down. Sure. Openers works. I, I like both. Welcoming game sounds pretty good. Yep. Welcoming a game sounds more family friendly to me. Like, like that's the game where you're like kids, families, come play. I, and I and I can go, I can go blue if you want to start talking opening. So uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh we'll skip that. But <laughs> I think well welcoming definitely has more overall family friendly uh connotations to it. Yes. Uh, and is harder to take down into uh, the sewers of my mind. There you go. All right. <laughs> so let's finish this off by boldly going to this question from Christian Christopher Lundgren. What is your favorite, if you have one, Star Trek board game or miniatures game? All right. Star Trek's interesting. Uh, of all the licenses out there, I think Star Trek has the biggest mixed bag of games created using that license. Like there are some absolutely terrible games with the Star Trek license. And I'm not talking 1970 roll and move and move your standy for Kirk around the Enterprise. I'm not even talking modern Star Trek games and some really fantastic games. And honestly, I was thinking about this. Like I, I started writing this out, right? And I, and I got Christopher's question. I, I, I thought of my immediate answer. And then I thought of two others. I kind of like, I like runner ups, right? And then I'm like, oh, but I've also got this. And then there's that. And then I started thinking about all the bad ones I don't own, but I played. And we might eventually turn this into the best Trek games I've played. What I'll need to do beforehand is I'm going to try to get Sean to play a few of them so that we can both talk it, talk about it. So so here are my favorites, though. We're not doing that full thing tonight. Um, the, I, will, I will throw out one bad one not to pick up. Um, no, I can't remember the name of it. It's, it's, it's Star Trek Bridge Cruise, and it has... Both the new generation, the old, but it's just Yahtzee. You're rolling dice <laughs> to try to match patterns. Now I got to look it up if that's the right name. Crew, no, that's the video game Bridge Crew. Anyone played that? Because I thought about picking it up. Star Trek Bridge Crew. Uh, no, this is video games. No, I can't remember it now. Oh well, not important. So I won't do a bad one. We'll just talk about good ones. <laughs> games you open a bottle of beer to play. There's a, there's an episode. <laughs> we don't want to advocate drinking too much. I, I probably do that more than I should as it is. Uh, so anyway, number one, the, the first one that, that I want to mention, because this is actually really solid, is Star Trek Expeditions from WizKids Games. Uh, this is a cooperative board game based on, um, what do they call it? The Kelvin Trek, I think is what people are calling it nowadays. But the new relaunch of Star Trek reboot, uh, with Chris reboot. Pine. Yeah, yeah. yeah the reboot. Um, which sadly seems to be dead. I actually really enjoyed the reboot. Um, so this one is a Star Trek episode in a box. You have one planet, you have the Enterprise in orbit, you have a Klingon battle cruiser coming into the planet, and you are sending out away teams to deal with situations on the planet. Now, there are multiple different scenarios you can play through, and it's actually a branching path as you play through all of them. So, like after you've done one thing, if you ended up solving the first problem on the planet you move on to this next part and then if you don't solve that like it branches whether you win or lose each section it's really well done um you have little clicks like figures and the clicks all it is is when they take damage you click them so unfortunately WizKids is famous for this you can't use them with hero clicks i don't know why they don't stick to the same thing um but same thing with the enterprise the the clicks is actually how how you distribute your energy so you can move it like between shields and engines and you just turn the click to whatever three settings you want for whatever. I think it's shields, weapons and engines. Again, good use of clicks, but don't buy this thinking you're going to get to play hero clicks. Um, only comes with four characters, but there is a mini expansion with three more. So you end up with actually a, a total of uh, seven different crew members you can use. You're going to use four per game. And it's really neat because you can mix and match, right? Like you got Kirk and Uhura, Sulu's one of the uh, expansion ones. You've got Spock and I think Scotty is in the main game. I can't remember who else is in the, the expansion. But this really feels like playing through one episode of Star Trek, but with the new crew. Because there are no episodes with the new crew. But it feels like you're playing through a Star Trek episode. And it's really neat. Uh, and... Uh... Uh, Red Meeple Ryan is saying five year mission is the dice game. Is that is that it? Five year mission. It's the one where where it combines both bridge crews from next generation and the original. 
I'm going to look quick and see if that is the one. That's probably the one. And I'm just looking at who comes with the expansion here. Yeah, which uh, come with which? So it can, you get Scotty, Sulu, and Chekhov. Okay. So yeah, Star Trek Five Year Mission, that is the one. And it's like, take control of the Enterprise, roll dice, and survive the perils of your mission. But it's just, it's roll for it yeah, type of thing. <laughs> like, you're rolling dice, and you're putting them on top of cards with pictures of the crew. And like the whole thing where it shows the Enterprise crew looking at the Enterprise crew on the box, that doesn't really come into play. It's just you have cards from both genres. It just, I, I honestly was, was is it Nizia? No, I'm surprised. It just felt like a math game. And, yeah, and it, it Nizia is the Expeditions. Oh, there you go. Well, Expeditions <laughs> is good. Um, it just, it, it felt like I was doing something mechanical with a Star Trek theme. It is, it is one of the, the worst I played. Yeah. Um, sorry for fans. If you dig it, great. I uh, did not enjoy Expeditions that is not rated all that well, though. Uh, it's only a 6.5. Uh, the problem is it's one episode on one planet. Right. Once you've done it once, you kind of seen it mm. and you can replay it and the path might branch another way. But and, and like uh, I still own my copy. I am willing to play it again, but it was not one I wanted to play even like a week later. Like I played it and I'm like, I don't want to play now. We just played this. But give it a month. I totally would play again because you, you change the locations and you change where these tokens are. And it does get mixed up but you're playing one episode over and over and right. you're going to know the ending there, even though I think there's like eight different endings. So you could try for all of them. Uh, next up is star Trek attack wing. This was, I don't know if it was the first or second. I don't know what came first, the dungeon and dragons attack wing or this, but one of the first games to license the X wing uh, series one, like the original X wing system and put out a new game for it. Now I enjoyed it quite a bit. I got to play it because of a local gamer. Uh, I'm not even going to try to name them because I, it's not popping in my head right away. Awesome local gamer brought it out to an event we had at Brimstone Games and I played it and I'm like, wow, this is good. Like really good. Uh, the problem was I then tried to buy copies and it was out of print at the time. Now they have released a brand new edition of this and a new set was released yesterday. So despite the fact WizKids doesn't really talk about this game, it is still supported. Despite the fact you haven't seen anything new in a couple of years, that's COVID, not WizKids. They're now coming out with the latest set, which is a new Klingon set. It looks really cool. Um, I have not played this new edition, so I can't talk to it. I don't know if it's based on X-Wing 2nd Edition or they relaunched the whole game or if they changed anything. But what I really liked about this, which makes perfect flipping sense when you realize it's Star Trek, is it's all about the crews and less about the ships. Whereas X-Wing is all about the ships and technically the pilot, but they're one and the same in X-Wing. Like if you, when you, when you buy an X-Wing, you choose, is it, is it Wedge's X-Wing? Is it Luke's X-Wing? Is it Hobby's X-Wing? You do that. Whereas this one, you pick the Enterprise or a Cavort class cruiser. And then your cards, instead of being a bunch of upgrade cards, were all different crew. And that was just really, that felt like Star Trek. And then, of course, there were rules for boarding parties and beaming onto other ships and beaming your characters to some of your own ships. And that made it feel very different from X-Wing. Plus, they went epic with the original release of this game where you could buy a two-scale DS9. And many of the missions were campaign-based. Instead of just blow the other people out of space, there was something to do. Because, again, it's Star Trek, not X-Wing. You weren't just trying to shoot the other people out of space. You were trying to accomplish a mission. I really dig that game. Um, if I played two player miniature battle games, uh, for one, I'd probably be playing X Wing Second Edition, but I would be looking to pick this up. It's just not something I do in my current gaming life. We are not, if Sean starts coming over more often, maybe we'll start doing two player stuff. But Deanna and I, if we're going to play a two player game, it's not Star Trek Attack Wing. It's interesting. I mean, you know, for a game that came out in 2013 to have expansions coming out in 2021 2022 well that's the new edition like i said there, it's there's a new edition out there even See, though it's it's only got one listing yeah that's weird that there's they're not like there's no edition there's no version listing for a new version yeah so maybe it's that similar like maybe yeah. it didn't change enough to need a new it's one of the things that again if i was Sean's not a big Trek fan either. He'd probably rather play X-Wing with me even though i know he's not even a huge Star Trek fan either but i think he likes Star Trek more than Trek Oh, it's hard to say. I, it, that's a, yeah. it's a tough call between the pair of them. Um, I, I probably do lean more towards Trek because it does, while it's not hard science, it's closer to hard science than it's Space trying. Wizards. Yes, <laughs> it's trying. Well, it, it, it's sci-fi versus sci-fantasy, I think, is, yeah. is the, the, the main thing. 
Yeah. So now my top Star Trek game, and honestly, if you Google this question, this is going to be everyone's top Trek game, as far as I can tell. Everyone loves this game. That is Star Trek Ascendancy. This is Star Trek in a box, not an episode. Star Trek, all of it, the entire thing from forging new warp lanes to discovering new worlds to seeking out new civilizations uh, to literally the map can change as you're playing because you're like, oh, the next planet is three parsecs away and you literally put the parsec out. And you, you can move it to connect the planet because it's 3D space and it kind of represents 3D space in, in, in two dimensions. And I think at this point, I, I don't know, there's got to be at least nine factions out for this game. Um, interestingly, it is one of the few three player only games when it launched. It was you had to play three players. You had the Federation, the Romulans and the Klingons, and that was it. But as the game evolved, you can now I think you can actually play with all the factions on a massive game. This is a game I actually went out and bought the battle map for because you're supposed to play on a three by three plant like grid because the planets will get too close to each other and you'll, we won't be able to fit them all. Though I know people who play on stuff like my eight by four board game table and don't worry about that and just let the let the whole solar system sprawl. You are doing Trek things. You're, you're landing on planets. You're going through encounters. You're sending away teams. You're building fleets. You're having ship combat. You're doing the things you do in Star Trek. If you are the Klingons, you get points for wiping people out and taking over colonies. If you're the Federation, you get points for converting people to your cause. Uh, you are space missionaries because that's pretty much what Star <laughs> Trek actually is. And you are going to the Klingon planets and converting them to Federation. And while the Romulans are just the Romulans and they kind of get points for doing both things. They want to blow some things up, but they also want to subvert other players' colonies. And it's fascinating. Now, I will admit, for how much I like this game, it's epic. It's long. It's, it's, it's not Twilight Imperium, but it is not a quick game. And I don't get it to the table often enough. And because of that, I only own the original three factions. Right. This I mean, is one that if I knew more Trekties, I would probably buy more and play it more often. I mean, because this is a three player, three hour, yeah. 3.16 weight. I, that's game. three hours when you know what you're doing. Exactly. Right? right. But if you do enjoy it, you can play Ferengi, Cardassian, Borg, Vulcan, Andorian, Dominion, and Breen. Um, so we're at seven? Was that seven so factions? There, there are seven additional factions on top additional. of... The so Romulan, Klingon, and, Fe and Federation. Wow, so 10. 10. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And there's some cool stuff. Like, if you buy the Borg expansion, it was the first expansion that came out. The Borg start in the center of the galaxy and spread out, okay? The thing is, there's two ways to play the Borg. You can now play a four-player game. Someone plays the Borg. Or they can be an AI faction that's against everyone. And I thought that was fascinating. Like, that is just a brilliant way to represent the Borg in a Star Trek game. And that's kind of what everything in this is like. It's just like... They managed to nail the factions. They managed to nail the differences. They managed to catch all the little aspects of Star Trek all in once. Yeah, no, this this is the one of the three that really interests me. Uh, you look at the design, the design team behind it, oh, yeah. Aaron Dill, John Kowalewski, and Sean Swigert. Um, you know, there's some great names behind it, and they've clearly put a lot of weight into it. Yeah. Both the base game and all of the expansions, other than uh i think one of them is yeah the the breen confederacy isn't isn't showing very well but it's oh, also that was the, the newest, newest it's the newest one so it could be i mean one i don't even know who the breen are uh deep but, space nine oh from yeah deep space the, nine. yeah breen are one of those uh, i never really did deep space nine well but, the pro okay my, my theory on this and i'm probably going to get some hate mail mo at tabletop bellhop.com <laughs> is they made the klingons weak in deep space nine because they're working with the federation so they needed a new badass and the right. Breen were the, the badass. You never saw their faces and no one could defeat their ships. Fair. Right. So like to me, that's why they were at it. I don't know if that's the reason, but it felt like it. It kind of felt like they, you know. Yeah. No, that's fair. Weakened the Klingons. So, uh, uh, so, so Darkling yeah, Blade. Ascendancy. Ascendancy says the one that, to me, sounds like the one I'm most interested yeah. in giving a try. Now, before Ascendancy, there was Star Trek Fleet Captains, which I used to call Star Trek in a box. But Ascendancy just did it so much better. I have no interest to play fleet captains. Fleet captains, again, was Wiz kids with clicks. You controlled the fleet of three ships and you explored. You went to spots on the board. You flipped the planet over and did what was there. And sometimes it was a combat encounter. Sometimes it was it was exploration. You need the right crew there and you could fight the other player. 
which was awesome. Like when that came out, we're like, oh my God, nothing feels like Trek as much as this. But Ascendancy just like, I, I'm sorry, Fleet Captains. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure why I still own you because <laughs> I have Ascendancy. So Darkling Blight in the chat said, took seven hours at a con using the Dominion War expansion with six players and noted the Borg was in play, but never actually showed up. So there you go. If the Borg's like a thing that may or may not happen, that's even cool. Like you might run into the Borg. Interestingly, Fleet Captains is rated uh, almost exactly the same as Ascendancy. Ascendancy. There, so the fans still like it. Yep. Uh, fans said, honestly, I should sit down and play both again. Fleet Been Captains is a tiny bit lighter. Uh, and yes. again, that still leads me to believe that Ascendancy is probably the game for me. Yeah. Not that I'm a heavy gamer, but a, out of two games that are similar. If you're playing Trek, you you kind of want a bit of heaviness or you want super light. Right. I, I'm I'm going to I'm going to feel that I feel like the the slightly heavier is, is just going to draw me in a little bit more, a little bit more meat to it um, yeah. rather than, you know, unless I'm playing unless I want to play something that's family and then three is mm -hmm. too high anyway. So it doesn't matter. Yes. <laughs> Now, the one thing that didn't happen with fleet captains is you don't have the expansions, right? Like you're, you're, you're done at that point. Uh, so Jeff Seuss calls out the story game kingdom would be an awesome Star Trek role-playing session, which does lead me to an honorable mention, the Star Trek role-playing game by FASA. I, I picked that up on eBay at a decent price. Like I didn't overpay for it, but I didn't get it cheap. Um, back then I was running single session Saturdays or Sundays. I don't remember what day of the week it was trying to play through games that were iconic that I never played that like I had copies of and stuff and replaying old favorites. So, like we played Marvel superheroes and I read and breeder bombs for anyone who remembers that. And Sean actually drove down from Hamilton to play this. Um, and if I remember you even came with an app with like sounds from Star Trek to use while we were playing. And we played through first edition fast of Star Trek and it was fantastic. Um, and it wasn't like the players mattered. The players enjoyed it. It was the fact that everyone knows Trek and knows techno babble and knows how Trek's supposed to progress. And it, it, it just, it clicked and everyone was on point and everyone just played Trek and it was awesome. Now, what I couldn't tell you is if it was despite the game or if the game was actually that good, too. But I will say it didn't feel like we were fighting with it at all. Yeah, which is an important fact. Yes. Now, Ride Meeple Ryan in the chat is calling out Star Trek Adventures, which is the latest Star Trek role playing game that, man, I'm curious. But as everyone knows, since we started this show, me getting role playing games to the table has gotten difficult. And I already have a pile that I feel obliged to play. So. Yeah, Star yeah Trek, so Jeff Seuss. Yeah. Star Trek, yeah, Star Trek from FASA has a reputation for being one of the few RPGs of that era tied to an IP that actually fit the IP instead of just being D&D &D in the Star Trek universe. Yeah, Thank it very you. much was not D&D. &D. Uh, it, it, it predates Travel, or no, it's after Traveler. But like Traveler, you actually go through Starfleet Academy and make dice rolls to see where you end up when you get out and have skills based on how you did. And it was D100 based. And then the combat system and the exploration system was basically XCOM before XCOM existed. To the fact that I wonder if the people who designed XCOM played this because it was an action point system. You got so many points a turn based on some of your stats and you use them like literally in a spend one to move forward, spend half to turn, you know, uh, spend six points to fire a phaser kind of thing. Yeah, it wasn't Traveler with a facelift either. No, I agree, Jeff. I, I, maybe someday I'll run it for you. <laughs> now, I enjoyed that game so much, I had heard from fans that the second edition is even better, so went out and bought a copy. That I did overpay for. Well, not really. I paid going market price for in 20-whatever for a, a game that that's old. Um, and I've heard it's even better, but I never actually ran that one. That was that was on my list to do, and we never did. Right. So you have have you played any Trek games at all? Uh, just that FASA, <laughs> just the just FASA, FASA RPG, RPG. Yeah. yeah, which was a ton of fun. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think we need to sit you down. Um, I know you just like I know you're not a huge Trek fan, but like most Trek games are just good sci-fi games. Yeah, yeah. Like Ascendancy absolutely. is a three fix, three faction four X game. Yeah, I think I think definitely the Star Trek as opposed to the Star Wars are going yeah. to be more attractive to me as games in just in general. So, so I still think you'd love Imperial Assault with its dungeon crawl feel. Because that's a totally different look at sci-fi. Right. 
All right. Well, uh, that's it for our answers of a few, uh, a few quest- short questions that we've been holding on to for far too long. Yes. And our update on where we've been. No, we didn't pod fade. Yes, we are back and ready to celebrate episode 200 next week. Now, remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Clicking on Ask the Bellhop at tabletopbellhop.com, send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or hitting me up on social media at tabletop, no, no, sorry, uh, where I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. 